Um, thanks so much for having us. So I'm um, sort of going to give an overview for um, Block A, the integration for digital objects. My name is Venkat. I'm one of the members in the archives of the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, India. And um, the website and the email are given there if anybody has any questions towards the end. A um, couple of housekeeping announcements. I know we've talked about this earlier, but uh, it would be awesome if people can just put their questions into the chat window. Um, and we'll take the questions up uh, towards the end of this, uh, this one-hour sort of session. Uh, we have four speakers. Um, I'm going to try and run through them as quickly as we can so that we have some time for questions towards the end. So uh, the way we want to sort of structure this is to sort of, as, as Christine mentioned, that there's, there's a certain need for the integration of digital objects. And I've sort of put a broad um, structure here to sort of give a sense of what we're going to try and do here. Um, we're not going to be covering the details of why archive space in this section, but we are going to say, um, as an archive, you're going to have a website, you're going to have a space to do um, annotations of material, you're going to have a space to um, describe, create resource records, but at the same time, you also have your digital objects. And um, the question then is, are there ways to integrate the two? Uh, perhaps as a way for you to search through your um, archive space catalog and you want to integrate that to the digital object or you have a ready digital object sort of search mechanism and you want to link it back to your resource records and archive space. Um, to approach this, we're going to have these four presentations. Um, we're going to focus mainly on open source systems as is the case with archive space. So we're going to be covering um, three digital asset management systems that are open source and these are DSpace, Islandora and Samvera. Um, I should, uh, of course, highlight that we're, uh, there's another um, lovely open source system out there that we're not going to be covering in this particular um, session, but people are definitely welcome to look at, which is the access to memory atoms uh, setup, which we have sort of mentioned towards the bottom of this slide. Uh, a quick sort of overview, if, if people haven't used it, I, uh, I thank Christine for mentioning this. I think uh, it sounds like maybe more than two thirds of the people listening on this uh, session or perhaps people who haven't sort of firmly sort of set their foot into archive space. So uh, just, just a heads up to say that these are the, um, the, the web links for DSpace, Islandora, and Samvera, the three digital asset management systems that the speakers uh, further down will be speaking about. Uh, and just gives a sense of the various locations they're used around the world. Um, and uh, we'll cover that a little later. So um, this is the flow of events uh, for the session. Um, I will start off uh, by talking about a situation where we have absolutely no digital asset management system. Um, and I'm hoping that there are a few uh, listeners on this group who are in our boat. We are a tiny little archive. We're still trying to figure this thing out. Um, and I'll talk about a setup that we have uh, just using the content management system Drupal. And uh, we're exploring the three options that um, have been mentioned uh, after us. Um, so after me, uh, we'll have uh, Georgetown University led by Suzanne Chase and Terry Brady talk about uh, their integration with DSpace. Uh, following that, uh, Tommy Keswick and Mariella Soprano will be talking about their Islandora integration. And um, towards the end of the session, we'll have uh, Noah Huffman from Duke University talking about their Samveda integration. Okay, um, a quick uh, background. The archives at the National Center for Biological Sciences is a space for the history of contemporary biology in India. Uh, we just opened to the public a month ago in February 2019, and we are a collecting public archive. Um, just a screenshot of our uh, sort of front office. So we're very, very new to that extent. I remember, I think um, Columbia had talked about how them having 8,000 collections. Well, we have 18. So we're, we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, but just to give you guys here so that use archive space, we, have, uh, we do use the public user interface that you can access through the catalog button on the top there. And I just wanted to give you a sense of how we have set up the system right now. We have two completely decoupled systems. Um, we have the archive space uh, resource records, and then we have um, a separate sort of digital object setup, and we haven't linked the two. So this is the, the lead up to the, to the catalog page of um, the, the public user interface of the archive space, which if you click through, looks similar to what uh, most uh, sort of vanilla setups look like. Uh, 
We will not go too much into why we picked our text space in this session, but if you're interested in, in those kinds of conversations, I encourage you to come to block C. Uh, there's a session on the making case for archive space, so do join us for that session. Uh, we've done very minimal changes to the public interface. We've removed things that we're not quite using, um, but I'll just lead you through this to sort of give you a sense of you know, where we're sort of um, stum I mean, struggling and trying to figure things out. Right, so uh, this is the standard interface, and let's just say I've, I've given an example of a of a search that we have done through our collections, search for the, uh, the for the word radio, and you know we've got twelve results that come up for this, for instance, and um, one of them happens to be this thing that I put a star next to, which is uh, sort of a manuscript from the manuscript uh, collections of a particular scientist, and this is um, something that let's say we're interested in. And we go ahead and click on this, uh, the origin of life script. And we, we get the resource record for this and we get the, the hierarchical sort of structure of where it is in the archive. Um, of course, the, the thing to note here, of course, is that you know, what we don't have here is that we don't have a link to the digital object. We do have the digital object. We just haven't made the links here. And so to get to that, you'll have to come you know, from elsewhere within the archive to sort of look at the digital sort of um, representation of this object. Um, this is a key thing that we maybe have to sort of uh, stress again and again, and that this will be talked about in three presentations after me, uh, about the sort of the differences between the resource record for the object and the digital representation of this object that they'll talk about towards the end. So um, going back, um, if we had to sort of go back to the, what I had mentioned early on about our sort of vanilla Drupal interface. So if you just click on the button on the top, we, we have um, a sort of a Drupal prototype um, and it just gives you a very, very basic prototype of about 400 objects that we have put out on the web um, to give us, to, to, to sort of structure out and see how we want to think about this integration. Uh, again, we can just, you know, I just put a sample search here for the word Urdu and, you know, we have these three search results. And as you can see, it's not quite nuanced because for instance, the, the object on the left Yes, it is um, an object that is written in Urdu, and that's why it shows up because it's one of the metadata fields that highlights. The one on the right, it's not quite nuanced yet because you know it's just you know flagging a false positive. Um, it's flagging Purdue, and so these are things that we need to sort of think about. Which ideally, if we had a more sort of um, intelligent digital asset management system, it'll be able to filter out the kind of ser intelligent searches that we are hoping to achieve through um, an interface like this. So anyway, let's we'll, we'll go ahead and click the, the object on the left, and you know you you get the details of um, the object detail page that we're actually looking for, and I'll I'll give you towards the end of this I'll tell you what we've done. It's very sort of very very simple as to what we've achieved, what we've done with this background structure. Um, each um, each digital object is set up as a node on on a Drupal platform, so it's relatively easy to add new objects or edit, but it sure isn't easy or efficient to do batch operations for any of the material and uh, especially when we start thinking of um, ingesting our tens and thousands of other digital objects that are just sitting on a server right now but we haven't sort of put them out on a publicly accessible interface and of course as we've mentioned here there is no link to the archive space platform on this on this section here um, this is eventually, if you were to click on the on on the thumbnail on the left, it just you know eventually leads to the the, the PDF document. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that you know we haven't done some sort of an elastic search, so um, it's a very sort of simple search where we're only searching through the metadata fields that we have mentioned here and about ten other fields that we have uh, populated as part of the the catalog, um, the metadata, the digital object catalog which is completely separate from the resource record catalog. So there's a certain duplication of data that we've had to go through. And this is something else that we would like to eliminate as we go forward. So um, what we ended up doing, as you can see here, so this, this Excel sheet that you see here is really just a, a, a complete duplication of our archive space. Um, catalog structure and so we we're trying to i mean we just did this for about 400 objects just to see how this might work but we are at the juncture now where we're thinking okay fine we need to do this in a more sort of elegant systematic way and so this is i just wanted to leave this here sort of to say that we're looking at all the other presenters to see how they have used the different dams that they're working with uh dspace islander and somewhere so um i'll sort of 
bring us back to the sort of integration challenges uh, slide to keep this in focus of what people are trying to do, which is you know uh, going from archive space to, to, the, to the digital object or vice versa from the digital object to archive space um, in their various uh, implementations. So with that said, I am going to thank you so much for your time and uh, hand it off to uh, Georgetown University now. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, this is Suzanne Chase. Um, we're just going to get started with our presentation here, just a second. So, okay, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Suzanne. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, so thanks for joining us. I'm Suzanne Chase. I'm the head of the Digital Services Unit at Georgetown University Library, and I'm here with Terry Brady, who's the Senior Software Developer at Georgetown University Library, and both of us work within the library's IT department. Um, our slides for the presentation are uh, linked from the, the forum page, the direct page, but you can also get to the slides as well as all the documentation and links we're going to be sharing um, through this bit.ly link right here. Okay, so to start off, we're just going to give a little bit of a background. Um, as Vincott said, thank you, Vincott, for that wonderful introduction. We're going to be focusing on the integration between our DSpace repository and our archive space public user interface. Um, so just as background, Digital Georgetown is our repository. Um, we currently run DSpace version 6.3, and within the repository, we host both institutional materials such as electronic theses and dissertations and faculty scholarship, um, works of faculty scholarship, as well as digitized special collections materials from our Booth Family Center for Special Collections. And those are the materials that we'll primarily be focusing on today. Um, so in terms of archive space, we migrated from Archivist Toolkit and adopted the public user interface at the same time back in 2016. And we updated our instance to version 2 in August 2017. Um, so what we're focusing on today with our linking of archive space hierarchy to DSpace digital objects is a workflow that we developed in the fall to harvest EAD metadata from archive space and convert it into item level metadata for ingesting materials that have been digitized into our DSpace repository. That's sort of step one of our workflow. Um, step two is that we then create digital object records within archive space that link back to those digital files that we host in DSpace. Um, as Vincott said, you know, we're um, not getting too far into the um, object model. Oh, sorry, Terry, could you go back one slide? Thanks. Um, we're not getting too into the object mo data model of archive space um, objects today. Um, a few of the other presenters are going to be talking about them as well. But um, if you haven't used archive space extensively, one thing to just quickly um, chime in about is that you have an archival object record, say, um, you know, a, a record for a letter in a correspondence series, and then you might have a digital object record for that digital file um, that you digitized from the physical item. So um, by creating a digital object record, it's actually an instance that you link to the archival object records, and um, it's a little bit of a complicated process, and um, it's a great functionality that Archive Space has, but it's um, something that we found to be a little bit of a manual process and can take a, a while to do within the public user interface. So with this workflow, we'll be demonstrating. Um, this is sort of a way we've expedited creating those linkages and also how we've enabled them in bulk. Okay, so why would we want to do this? And Vincott kind of gave a great introduction to this. Um, Archive Space is a wonderful system for presenting a hierarchy of a collection. So a patron can come to your Archive Space user interface and navigate um, through a collection from the archives that maybe has, um, you know, the collection level, there's a series, subseries, folders, items. So you can kind of get that overall hierarchy that's really nice and helps situate archival materials within their context. Um, Alternatively, DSpace is the repository we use to present digital images of items from an archival collection, and um, you know it, it works really well for that function. And like most repository software programs, DSpace has a pretty flat hierarchy. You know, pretty much there's um, a collection and then items within that collection. So um, we have patrons who, you know, need to be able to browse the hierarchy of an archival collection with an archive space, but they um, should be provided with links to view digitized materials from that collection, as well as their associated item level metadata when they have been digitized, and that would happen through our DSpace repository. 
So the workflow that we're going to be walking through today enables that process and also creates uh, bi-directional links between the public user interface with an archive space and the DSpace repository. All right, so some of the tools where we'll be discussing today, um, and again, these uh, links will take you to our GitHub pages and um, other pages where you can read more about them. The first is File Analyzer, and this is an open source program that we developed here in our library IT department. And we use this program for lots of purposes. Um, it's really a, a great tool, and um, please do check it out, and um, you're welcome to, we hope you do um, look into it and, and download it for your own purposes, and we're happy to chat about that. Um, specifically for this workflow, we use File Analyzer to convert ArchivesSpace EAD metadata that we export from the staff interface of ArchivesSpace user interface into Dublin Core metadata. Um, we use Excel and Google Sheets pretty much for everything, like probably most of you, but specifically for this workflow, we use it for um, those uh, tools for editing and adding item level metadata um, for the Dublin Core metadata that we use to ingest into our DSpace repository. Um, DSpace ingest tools and DSpace report tools, of course, these are unique to DSpace. So for those of you who are DSpace users, you're probably familiar with them. Um, we use them for batch uploading digital objects and their metadata into our repository. And then the report tools we use for exporting the digital object thumbnails. Um, and we'll be showing this in our uh, walkthrough of our, our demonstration in a second. Um, if you use a different repository system, there's probably a similar type of tool set for batch uploading objects, and I know uh, some of the other presenters will be discussing those. And finally, um, it's been mentioned before in the, the earlier um, session, Harvard's Excel import plugin um, we make use of for this purpose for creating the digital object records. So this is a great tool for lots of purposes, um, including creating records within archive space um, if you're just starting out or doing um, rapid data entry. And we use it um, for specifically for this workflow for creating those digital object records. And as we mentioned, all of the links um, for, and documentation are available from our, uh, this bit.ly link right here. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna describe the workflow uh, to you all. And this, uh, this is a workflow that has a lot of steps. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna as I step through our presentation, I'll highlight different uh, components of this workflow diagram. I would say with, with this workflow we've automated, we're really trying to reuse existing tools wherever possible. This isn't a workflow that we run frequently. This will probably be run a few times a year. Uh, but what we wanted to do is kind of eliminate the most tedious uh, aspects of trying to synchronize DSpace and archive space objects. So the first step that we start with is we export an EAD file from an archive space collection record. Uh, so here uh, what you're seeing is we're going to pull down an archival resource object which might have some archival object hierarchy attached to it and we'll export that as an EAD XML file. We accomplish this by going into the staff interface, navigating to the resource page, and then indicating that we want to download an EAD file. Once that download is complete, we'll um, have an EAD XML file with um, appropriate levels of hierarchy um, embedded inside the document. Our next step then is we want to convert that EAD file into Dublin Core metadata, which we use for DSpace. So in this instance, we take that EAD file, we pass it to our file analyzer application, and from there we'll create an export file of Dublin Core metadata in CSV format. So here's just a little uh, visualization um, of the process. I'm gonna let this little uh, link um, restart here in just a second and I'll talk, talk you through the um, demonstration. So here we're um, selecting our EAD file. We're indicating we wanna run the EAD to Dublin Core conversion. There's some boilerplate text we're able to set. We generate a table that we can review. Then we uh, come in here and name the CSV file that we want to export from the tool. Next then, we have the ability to edit that Dublin Core metadata file to sort of contextualize the metadata for the digital repository. Um, in some instances, the, the patron or the user of that system might expect uh, slightly different metadata than they would expect in the archival, archive space context. Uh, so here we're just showing that we've got the CSV file and we can edit it in Google Sheets or Excel. After we've customized that metadata, we then prepare ingest folders for, um, for DSpace. 
So in this instance, we have uh, digital objects that we want to load. We have this uh, CSV file of metadata that we want to associate with those objects. And we want to then uh, package that up and import that into DSpace. So this, we, we could do a whole, a whole uh, little session just on this process. So I'm simplifying it here and just showing you that we have a metadata file. Through that metadata file, we have some connection to our set of um, bitstream or digital objects we want to load. We use the simple archive format ingest process in DSpace to load those objects into a collection. So here's a, a view of um, our bitstreams or digital objects within DSpace. Here I'm viewing the digital media that we've located, loaded into DSpace. So here we are in uh, digital Georgetown. Um, we're going to uh, browse to a collection of student catalogs, open up a particular item. From that item, we've got uh, a bunch of metadata that we uh, had its origin in archive space and the digital object and thumbnails are accessible within this system. So now that we have both metadata associated with digital objects with permanent URLs in DSpace, we need to um, export that association um, as a CSV file. So in this instance, we're going to use um, a uh, one of the DSpace out-of-the-box reporting tools, and I'll, I'll uh, talk you through this process here in just a second. I'm going to let this uh, video restart. So I'm selecting our student catalogs collection. I'm indicating that I want all the objects within this collection. I'm selecting particular metadata fields, um, in particular the, um, the permanent URL for the items. I'm indicating I want the um, URL for both the digital object and the thumbnail. And from that, I generate a table of metadata associating the digital objects and the metadata. We export that data, and uh, from that, we can generate an Excel import file that um, works well with the Harvard plugin for digital object import. So here I'm showing that uh, we're selecting the EAD to DAO template process. So we're taking our original EAD file, we're taking the exported CSV file that we just uh, generated. In this case, we're matching on title, but we can match either on title or uh, ref ID from archive space. Once we've merged that data together, we have a table of metadata we can export. And here is a view of that exported metadata in Excel. And this is loaded into Excel using the template file that Harvard's provided. And from that Excel spreadsheet, we can then use the Harvard plugin to import that into archive space. So here I am looking at a collection record in the archive space uh, staff interface. I'm indicating I want to load uh, digital objects via a spreadsheet. I select my Excel file. I indicate I want to load archival objects and import from a spreadsheet. Once that um, import has completed, you'll see a confirmation uh, indicating the digital objects that have been created. So next we can actually view those digital objects in the archive space public interface. So I'm navigating to a particular um, archival object, clicking on the associated digital object, and you'll see then that that associated digital object is linkable back to our DSpace collection. So we've now created a round trip of our metadata and links between the two systems. And Suzanne, I think uh, at this point, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, so um, Terry just kind of showed the full workflow um, culminating in a, a digital object record um, that is linked as an instance from an archival object record within this collection. Um, that sort of functionality and um, the way it displays within the user interface is um, sort of a part of the archive space public user interface installation, and it's a great feature. Um, one thing that is not currently available, however, is um, that same ability to link a digital object um, collection level record on a collection level resource record within archive space. So um, 
you know, here, for example, we are on the landing page for the student prospectuses and related materials collection, the collection that we've been demonstrating, and you don't sort of see that inset box with the digital object link with the nice thumbnail. Um, this is something we've, um, we're hoping um, in the future can be added to uh, the, the system because we would, we think that would be a really great um, add-on, but until that's available, we sort of have a workaround where um, and once a collection has been digitized and we've um, populated all the digital object links within the archival objects, we've gone into the finding aid, um, you know, the edit screen and, and added within the scope and contents note just this statement that the collection's been digitized and is available online to view in Digital Georgetown. So you can click the link and we've also created a little custom thumbnail that says, you know, view online that's also linked right to the collection within our repository. Okay, so um, now that we've sort of had an overview of this uh, process, what are our next steps? So, um, well, we've implemented this entire workflow for exactly one collection. That's the one you just saw um, in production. This is sort of our pilot project um, that we've demonstrated today. And um, once we sort of went through the process of um, implementing that and worked out our kinks, um, we're ready to sort of roll this out um, for new collections. So um, we are actively refining our processes and tools as we implement this. Um, for example, example, just last week, we um, exported the EAD from a newly digitized collection and ran it through File Analyzer and realized that um, some of the, um, you know, the, some of the record uh, metadata within the EAD wasn't mapping through File Analyzer into a Dublin Core field exactly how we wanted it to. So we were able to go in and sort of refine that XSLT and um, add in the newly, the new fields that we wanted. So we are currently still refining this. Um, Finally, sort of the third um, final step in this is that we plan to revisit collections that have been digitized um, in the past and have been available in our DSpace repository for a while to go back and add in those digital object links to those collections finding aids. And this will be a bit of a um, longer term project just since we won't be able to use the archive space ref ID to match um, those items. We'll have to, to focus on the title match for that. So, um, but this is something that we will be doing over the long term. Um, and finally, here's just some more information if you'd like to see um, a link to the archive space uh, record that we demonstrated today, you can um, click on that top link um, to view the digital collection within our DSpace repository. It's that second link. And then again, here's all of our do uh, documentation within GitHub and links to the tools we've demonstrated. And finally, we would love to hear from you if you are interested in this or if you're thinking of adopting either DSpace or Archive Space or you already have both and are looking for, you know, more details to implement this, um, please feel free to reach out to Terry and I. Thank you. And I think up next we have um, Caltech. So as they get started here, just give us one second. Hello everyone, this is Mariela Soprano and I'm here with uh, Tommy Kesig. Uh, we are from Caltech Library and Archives. I think our slides are on so we can start. So we would like to begin with uh, giving you a brief historical background of why we decided to work on integrated, uh, integrating archive space in Dailandora. Uh, a Caltech archives, one of our first digital collections uh, was the Paul McCready paper, uh, papers. This was our first large digitization project uh, that included over 60,000 uh, digital files. We started this project in 2013. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, sorry, we are in progress with our screen. And, uh, and this was well before the archive space PUI was actually even on the plans. Um, so we batch uploaded the digital files into our uh, island door instance and uh, decided that we wanted to present them within the hierarchy of the finding aid. In order to achieve this, we uploaded the finding aid to Islandora, and the slides uh, shows you that, and uh, we linked them to the digital files. So we were able, as you can see, to uh, achieve our goal, uh, but the search results were really cumbersome and very confusing. Um, in fact, it took several steps to, the, to get to the desired image within the finding aid. 
So you had to go to open first, we'll go down one step and then go down a further step. And then you ended up also having for each single uh, uh, folder a descriptive summary, which wasn't very um, informative. And uh, um, uh, so that was uh, uh, rather confusing. Um, and uh, um, we uh, then, once you got to your image, and if you wanted then to navigate back to uh, the point within the finding game that uh, you had started from, you were actually unable to do that. So you went back to the uh, subdivision of the finding show on a serious level. So you had to go through uh, again through the, um, all the steps to go back to a, a new search. Um, so we decided that once uh, the PUI was launched, uh, that it would really make a lot more sense uh, trying to work on integrating um, our Irandora repository to Archive Space and use uh, the uh, Archive Space PUI navigation to navigate through our digital objects. And that's what the work we have been doing uh, for the last year or so. So I'm passing on to Tommy, who will uh, show you the workflow. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mariel. This is Tommy. Um, I, I'll just add one more thing to what Mariella was just saying. We could have made a choice between either spending a lot of development time and effort on improving the interface for a finding aid in Islandora, or we could take what was given to us out of the box with the public user interface of archive space. And so what we decided was that we'll use each tool for, whoa, we'll use each tool for what it is good for. Archive space is great for the metadata search, browse and display, and Islandora is great for the digital object viewing and the full text searching is what we also use it for. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay, so everybody knows what the, the public user interface looks like, but we also have a great browser in Islandora for looking at digital objects that lets us do a full screen zoom, like really deep zoom levels, navigate pages of a folder, and that sort of thing. So each of them has a best use case, and that's what we decided to, to go with. And so our process here is very similar to what Georgetown does. I'll go through it from a different angle, a little bit different angle. And so what we do here at Caltech, um, or what we did on the next collection after, after the one that Mariella was explaining is that, so we'll process each collection at the folder level with the metadata entered on a spreadsheet, just because that's the easiest way for archive staff to work. Um, the next thing we do is that we call scripts. I wrote some scripts that will load the objects into Islandora based on the spreadsheet metadata. And in this case, a file naming scheme is essential. It's how we connect our metadata and the spreadsheet to the files on disk. In our case, we have a, a file naming scheme for our digital objects like our, our TIFFs or whatever other digital objects we have. We name them with a special a collection ID, and then a series number, a box number, and a folder number, and then whatever item number within that folder. That is a, a known string that can then be associated with the metadata on that line of the spreadsheet, and it will be able to grab, the scripts that we write will be able to grab the correct file and put it into Islandora associated with the correct metadata. This also requires arranging things in a, in a proper hierarchy for our batch import tools. Um, the next thing we do after we have Islandora objects created is that there's another script that I write that uses it. Oops, oh, this is the wrong mouse. Um, okay, we, the next thing we use is a script that works with Islandora that grabs the newly created Islandora IDs that will give us um, the ability to know what the URLs to the objects are and the URLs to the thumbnails in order to create the digital object link in archive space. And so when I use the script to batch download those, I can connect them with um, the metadata 
for our local identifiers in our in our spreadsheet and then drop in our Islandora identifiers so that way we know which objects in the spreadsheet are associated with which um, Islandora identifiers so that we can put all that information into archive space at that point. So then that final step then is to add it all, all this metadata into archive space. The very first time we did this, we didn't know about the Harvard importer, which we will use next time because we have found that it will be much easier. But we basically scripted the creation of an EAD, which allowed us to create the digital object links and all the metadata for every object as well. It was a, a little bit more intensive a process and needed, be, needed to be because we could be using the same spreadsheet with that plugin. Um, I'm not sure if plugins were described very very much in the in the presentations before ours, but I thought I would take a little detour and and talk about plugins in the archive space world if they haven't been described well, because some people may not even understand this idea of a plugin. Um, and I want everybody to be on the same page here. So a plugin is basically third-party code that gets added to the archive space instance, depending on if you host it yourself or if you're hosting it with somebody else that allows you to install a plugin. In our case, we host with Lyricist and they will enable a plugin like the Harvard importer. Um, you might have to check with your host to see if they have vetted the code and they want this plugin on their system because it is somebody else that's writing and you have to trust it a bit. But adding plugins to archive space can be very beneficial. And actually, there's another plugin that we're going to investigate using um, to work with some of our Islandora stuff that's also been developed by Lyricist. And so let me show you a little bit of the tools that we're working with here. Um, yeah, oops, let me go back. So this, why does this not work? Okay. Come on. My keyboard doesn't work very well. So yeah, similar to how... Um, Georgetown showed you the tools they're using. This is some of the tools we're using in our workflow. Again, Google Sheets. Um, in order to first upload things into Islandora, um, we're using the Islandora book batch module that works with a command line program called Drush. Um, that allows us to ingest all of those objects in a batch with the command line um, that I described earlier. And then to download all of the IDs from Islandora, we use a Islandora module called data stream CRUD, which stands for create, read, update, delete. And so that's another thing that I use a script with in order to download the things. And then what we would use is that plugin for archive space from Harvard that would allow us to upload everything from the spreadsheet. Um, the other plugin that we might use in the future is an Islandora archive space connector that there's just developed and we'll have to get that installed as well. Um, this is a screenshot from the Harvard Excel sheet that shows you where the blue section is all the digital object information. There's only three fields you need to make a digital object connected with all the other metadata for a resource record, and that's gonna be really great. So ultimately the result we get, and you've seen this already today, is a great archive space record that has a thumbnail link off to a digital object which links to the digital object and pulls the thumbnail live from our Islandora system because we entered the URL for it. And so now I can tell you about our future plans. Um, there's a few things that we don't have yet that we would like to have to make our workflows even more smooth. Um, the, we would like to have metadata sync from archive space to Islandora, meaning we want archive space to be the canonical place where we enter and edit metadata for our records. We don't want anybody to have to edit any metadata in um, Islandora because we've had dueling systems in the past and it just gets very confusing for archive staff and it can make records out of sync very quickly. And so we want to be able to sync things down from archive space into Islandora seamlessly and without anybody thinking about it too much. That's gonna take a plugin um, on the archive space side and a module on the Islandora side that we're gonna keep working on. Um, we would like to connect or work on a workflow for pre-existing collections. So we've got some collections that have been processed in archive space, but they have not yet been digitized or we haven't processed the whole digital object section of them yet. But the workflow that we've used so far 
revolved around creating Island Dora records first, but that doesn't work if we have archive space collections pre-existing. And so we have, we're working through that process to see how we're going to do it the best. Um, and the other thing is, is about design. We would love to create a seamless experience for our users between the archive space interface and the Island Dora interface so that they don't even really know they're traveling to different sites or different platforms to look at these things. And we want to be able to link from, from archive space to a digital object and then back without anybody really even noticing what they're doing. Um, oh, whoops. I keep using the wrong mouse. And I think that's about it. So thank you for listening. And I think we're going to throw this over to, to Noah. So go ahead, Noah, and I think you can just grab control. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Tommy and Mariella. Um, can everyone hear me? This is Noah. Yeah, we can hear you, Noah. All right. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, hold on one second. All right. Great. So um, again, yeah, I'm Noah Huffman. I'm the archivist for metadata um, systems and digital records here at the Rubenstein Library at Duke University. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've integrated our Samvera um, Fedora digital repository with Archive Space um, in order to help us streamline um, some of our digitization workflows um, here at Duke. Um, conceptually, the integration that I'm going to talk about is really similar to um, what the folks from Georgetown and Caltech have already described. It's just the components are a little bit different. Um, and it's been really interesting collaborating with these folks on this session and really seeing how we're all kind of trying to tackle the same problem, although a little bit differently. Um, before I get into kind of the specifics of the integration work, um, I just wanted to point out some of the different systems that we that we use here at Duke to give you some institutional context. So on this slide here um, are three of the applications that I'm going to talk about in the rest of the presentation. Um, on the left here, you can see the Archive Space staff interface. This probably looks really familiar to anyone who's using Archive Space. Um, we implemented Archive Space in 2015 here at Duke. Um, we currently use the staff interface to manage all of the dis our description of archival collections. Um, but I wanted to point out that we do not currently use the Archive Space public interface um, for, you know, public access to our finding aids. Um, we use a homegrown finding aid application that we call um, Tripod2. And you can see that in the middle screenshot here on the slide. Um, we had been using this homegrown application well before we implemented Archive Space. And so in order to publish finding aids in this older application, we just export EAD from Archive Space um, and then present it um, through this uh, Tripod2 platform. And then the last screen screenshot here is uh, a collection page in our, um, our digital repository that we've creatively named the Duke Digital Repository. Um, and this uh, is where we provide for discovery and access to digitized content from our collections. So when we got up and running with Archive Space and our new um, repository in about 2015, um, we started looking for ways that we could integrate, integrate these applications um, for a couple of, of primary reasons. Um, the first reason is we really wanted to make our metadata workflows more efficient so that we could repurpose description across systems and we weren't entering the same description again in, in different systems. Um, the second reason, uh, we really wanted to integrate uh, discovery and access to both archival description and to um, its related uh, digital content. So the first thing we did before taking on any kind of actual integration work was really sit down and kind of define our systems of record. And I think this is really important. I can't kind of stress this enough, but 
um, what we decided was that archive space would be our system of record for description of archival collections and their component parts. And that, that description would be based on the DAX um, standard. And we decided that our Duke Digital Repository would be the system of record uh, for, for storing metadata about digital objects and the files related to those objects. And so that metadata would include descriptive, technical, and administrative metadata. And kind of the principle here um, was to, to sort of let each system do what it does best. So archive space for archival description, digital repository for managing digital objects. So if archive space is not our system of record for digital objects or metadata about those objects, then what really is the point of a digital object record in archive space? And when we started thinking about this, we kind of honed in on these two, um, two functions of a digital object record in archive space. And the first function is really that to the digital object in archive space helps situate a digital object within the context of a larger archival collection. And secondly, um, it's just a means for allowing us to embed or provide links to a digital object within um, a view of a finding aid. So if those are really the only two kind of purposes of a digital object record in archive space, that means that digital object records in, in a space can be really simple. And at least for us, and this is an example of just a single digital object record in our archive space instance. And you can see here, we've, we're only really using five fields. Um, so we have a title field, um, an identifier field. Um, we have a field that notes whether or not that uh, digital object should be published. Uh, we have the full uh, URL that points to that object in our repository system. And then we have um, a use statement value. And this is just um, a way for us to instruct our finding aid application how to go about displaying that particular digital objects, digital object in the context of a finding aid. So whether to use an image viewer or whether to use something like a streaming audio or video player. <laughs> So what we really wanted out of uh, an integration then was just a quick way, a way to quickly create simple digital objects in archive space um, based on items that already existed in our repository. And then to be able to link those um, archive space digital objects to components in a resource record. So this diagram here kind of is kind of ridiculous, but um, I, it's an attempt to illustrate our digitization workflow at Duke. Um, I'm not going to cover all of these processes, but I really wanted to highlight this kind of purple box right in the middle of the diagram. And this box here represents the integration service that we built in our digital repository that allows us to automatically push metadata about digital objects in the repository to archive space um, using the archive space API. Um, to illustrate sort of how this service fits into our digitization workflow, um, on the next few slides, I'm just gonna step through the, our digitization workflow um, fairly quickly. So the first thing we do, um, like we do with any collection is we describe materials in archive space and we do this regardless of uh, whether or not collections are going to be digitized. Um, sometimes we describe at the folder level. Sometimes, although rarely, we might describe um, at the item level, um, which you see on the slide here. Um, for really long folder lists and item lists, um, we're using the Harvard Excel plugin that lots of folks have already mentioned. I can't recommend that highly enough. Um, the second thing we do is if we decide to digitize material from a collection, um, we export metadata about those uh, things that we're gonna digitize. We export metadata from archive space as um, CSV, so as a spreadsheet format. And we call these CSV files um, digitization guides. Um, and we have a couple ways that we do this at Duke. 
Um, the, first, the first way is using this digitization work order plugin. Um, so what this plugin, if you have it installed, what this plugin lets you do is select some set of, uh, of components in an archive space resource record that you want to export and then it, you know, select those and then you can export a CSV file that contains metadata about those particular components in archive space. Um, and there's a link to where you can find this plugin here on the slide. Um, a second method that we sometimes use um, is we will export EAD from archive space and then process that EAD file with some XSLT that will also generate a CSV file. We tend to use this method if um, a particular collection has like really detailed metadata and we want some extra columns in our CSV file that are not supplied by default in the using the plugin. Um, and at the bottom of the slide, you can just see an example of what one of these um, digitization guide spreadsheets might look like. Um, a really important thing to note um, on, these, on these spreadsheets is that there's always a column that includes the, the component ref ID value from archive space. And this is just an identifier that archive space uses to kind of absolutely identify every piece of description in, in archive space. And this is really critical to our integration um, service. So the next thing we do is we take those uh, CSV digitization guides, um, they travel down to our uh, digital production center where the scanning happens, um, files might be scanned. And then we take those CSV files along with the files produced during digitization, we bundle them all up and then we ingest them into our repository. Um, and this is just on the screen, the screenshots here are just an example of a, what a single, um, item record might look like in our repository system. And I've highlighted in red here just um, to note that we have a special field in our repository that stores the archive space ref IDs. Um, so the next step, and this is really the kind of the crux of our integration. Um, what you see here on the slide is um, a view of a single collection object in our repository. Um, this collection on the, that I'm showing here is an example of a collection of about 1600 um, scanned negatives. Um, so from this collection object, um, there's an actions tab that you can kind of see here. And then one of the available actions is uh, a link to create digital objects in archive space. And so what happens if I were to click this link is I'll go to this next screen. And then this is kind of queuing up the integration service that we, the custom integration service that we built in the repository. And here's a, a screen where you can kind of set some options for running this service. Um, let me step through real quickly and try to explain what this service is actually going to do. So um, when you load it up on a collection object, what it's going to do is it's going to log in to archive space um, using log into the back end of archive space using the API. And it's going to use the login credentials of whatever user is logged into the repository. So in order to use this service, a user has to have permissions to both log into the repository and permissions to log into archive space and create records in archive space. Um, the next thing it's gonna do is it's gonna look at every item that exists in that repository collection. So in the case that I showed you here with these negatives, it's gonna look at every, uh, all 1600 items and it's gonna check and see if those items have an archive space ref ID um, if they do have a ref ID value stored, it's going to look up those ref IDs in archive space and see if it finds a match. Um, if it finds a matching ref ID in archive space, it's going to create a brand new digital object record in archive space um, using metadata from the repository. 
after it creates that brand new digital object, um, then it's going to link that new digital object to the existing um, component record in the archive space resource record that you know describes that ar that object. And then finally, once it's done creating all of those objects and linking them to their archival components, it's going to send you or whoever's uh, email address is specified here on this form, it's gonna send a report of all of the actions that it took um, when you ran the service. Um, just to point out a few of the other um, options available when you run the service, um, you can determine whether or not you wanna publish digital objects in archive space when you run the service. Um, you can also run the service in uh, debug mode and this is really useful and something that we kind of added later on, but if I were to run this in debug mode, um, what it's gonna do is um, it's gonna check for all those archive space ref IDs, see if they exist in archive space, and it's gonna send me a report of everything that it found, but it's not actually gonna create any new data in archive space. So this is just a way to kind of do a, like a pre-flight sanity check of, um, of this integration uh, service before you actually run it in production. So this is just a really quick uh, screenshot of what one of these um, uh, one of these email reports looks like that you would receive after you run the service. It's going to show you all of the items it created in archive space. It's going to give you um, the URIs for those objects in archive space, both the archival objects and the digital objects. And then it's gonna give you kind of uh, information about whether or not the, the job was successful for that, for any given object. Um, again, this is just to show you um, an example of a simple digital object that gets created as part of the service. Um, it's the same one we looked at earlier, the only five fields um, this is just to show you that uh, the digital object, that the new digital object that gets created is linked um, automatically to the appropriate um, component record in the larger resource record. So it, you know, links it to the appropriate position. Um, and again, because we're still exporting EAD in order to publish finding aids, um, this just shows you a little snippet of EAD code and where the information about the digital object uh, is included as part of these uh, DAO tags in the EAD itself. Um, and then here is what a published finding aid would look like in our system after we've run this integration service and re republished the finding aid. And here you can see um, we've got this link to view images um, if I were to click that, it drops down this embedded image viewer directly in our finding aid interface. Um, I can zoom in or zoom out um, using this image viewer. And I, wanted, I just want to point out that this image here is being pulled into the finding aid interface directly from the repository. It's not sort of stored separately in anywhere. Um, there's also a link here if I want to view this same item in our repository interface. If I wanted to see sort of the more detailed, um, maybe technical or administrative metadata about it. Um, and that's what this uh, screenshot is showing you. So this is the same item viewed in the repository system. Um, and in the red box over here on the right, you can see it's giving some uh, contextual information about what source collection this source archival collection this item came from and it also includes this um, link where you can view the item in context so if I click that what it would do is it would take me straight back to the finding aid um, uh, application and drop you in the position where that where that item exists in the hierarchy um, so that's mostly it. Um, on this slide here, I've just put some links to um, some repositories in GitHub where the code for these services lives. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about in the presentation but 
kind of wanted to mention really quickly um, is that the last bullet point on this slide. Um, there's currently some work happening on developing this um, bit curator to archive space toolkit. Um, and I don't know if there are any bit curator users on the call, but um, this is kind of a suite of scripts that the bit curator team has been working on to kind of make the process of um, describing born digital materials in archive space a little bit more efficient. So what these scripts are intended to do is um, repurpose some of the metadata that gets generated in bit curator reports and um, import them into archive space. So I think these scripts are in kind of a beta phase right now, but um, we've been testing them and I think the folks on the bit curator team are really interested in, in getting more feedback on this as well. But that's all I have, thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Noah. Um, this is Suzanne again from Georgetown. I had sort of uh, volunteered to moderate the questions and I noticed that a few did come in um, via chat while um, everyone was speaking. Um, so I think uh, our first question that we haven't addressed is from Wendy um, and that's a question for Caltech. Um, we just, oh, and actually her question disappeared. So I'm not sure if Wendy has left the call. Wendy, are you still here? Oh, here it is. Okay. So for the Caltech presenter, um, when you indicate that all of the metadata is in a space for digital objects in Islandora, are you referring to item level metadata or a series collection level? So we do, we keep our uh, metadata down to the folder level only. We have not described any items within folders. And so the way that um, the links show up, that's really a folder level record and our Islandora objects are really folder level objects that we have displaying in a um, like a book viewer so that you can flip pages as if you were flipping through the pages in a folder. That's as far as we go down at the Islandora level as well as the folder level. And we have multiple images on one record that are delineated with pages on that record. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, yeah, so Wendy says it does. Thanks. Um, similarly, Richard and um, other folks have asked how, um, I think this is for Noah, um, how does it work if you stop description at the folder level? Um, and to follow up on that, how do you identify items if you only go to a folder level description? And um, feel free to chime in if you want to uh, contextualize your question. Yeah, I can try to answer that. So the example I showed in the presentation was kind of a simple like, you know, item level description to one item in the repository relationship. But we've definitely done um, collections where we describe down to the folder level in archive space. And then um, we have maybe, you know, 50 or 100 items in the repository that relate to that single um, folder. And the integration service can support that use case. So what it would do is it would link all of those digital objects. Um, it would create an item record, a digital object record in archive space for every item, but then it would just link all of those items to that folder level component. And sometimes we do additional description in the repository for items. And sometimes we just come up with a method of like sequencing them in a way that, um, so the easiest way to understand this is like maybe you have a folder title that's like correspondence 1865 or something and we might have like 50 items in that folder we would just sync them a uh, sequence them like item one of 50 two of 50 three of 50 or something like that um, so we don't have to do additional description but we do manage them as discrete items in their in the repository um, Marcella commented, we're trying to do a one-to-one -one match for archival description and digitization metadata, i.e. if manuscript collection is described at a folder level, it is digitized and presented at folder level using descriptive metadata from archival description, um, which I think is kind of exactly what Noah was saying. And um, just to chime in, we're doing the same at Georgetown. Does that answer the question? Richard had clarified, um, i.e. if the ref IDs are for the digital object. So um, if Richard, feel free to follow up if you have uh, further questions. Yeah, he said, yes, I think that's good. 
Um, okay, I think um, the next question is from Stephanie. She says, um, I think this is also for Noah Duke. I noticed in the five fields in archive space, in your example, you've chosen to not make the digital object representative. Can you explain why? Yeah, I think so. Um, my understanding is that that option only relates to if you are kind of using archive space as your public interface and you want to like present that image, um, that representative image at the um, on the collection view. Um, because we're not using the archive space public interface, like that really has no effect on us. <laughs> so we've kind of just ignored it. But if we were to start using the archive space public interface, it, it's probably something we would need to investigate. Great. Um, so we have a question from Mary. I think this is for anyone who would like to answer. Do folks generally run both a test instance of archive space and a production instance of archive space on their servers, or do they rely on the debug and or other built-in tools to prevent corrupting data when using back, batch functions? Um, speaking for Georgetown, we do have both a test and production system. So we um, use tests a lot to, to run these workflows and make sure they're working for us before rolling them out into production. Um, and Noah says, yes, we run tests and production instances, highly recommend. Um, Caltech, what about you guys? Actually, we don't. Uh, yeah, not that I know of. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why or, or whatever. Yeah, but. okay. Yeah, it, it would make a lot of sense, but we're just going to production and test it that way. I think we don't do a whole lot of customization, and so there's not anything we're testing a ton of. It's mostly this is the store for data, and we don't do anything tricky with our data, and so we don't need to test it beforehand, and we don't want to duplicate. But I can understand why people would have test instances when you're doing a lot of importing and, and whatnot. Um, I guess we don't worry about it, that's all. Great. And it looks like um, Tim and uh, from J Johns Hopkins and someone from Boston College have chimed in that they also run multiple instances. Um, okay, so I think I think the next question from Kara is, are there any plans to add the Harvard Excel import as a default plugin or integrated directly into archive space? Um, is there anyone from archive space who could answer that? Uh, this is Christine. I can probably just briefly say, um, we know this is incredibly popular. Uh, so this is something we're very interested in. Uh, and part of it is just like thinking about the technological way that it could be done and working with the developer uh, who created that great plugin uh, to figure out what makes makes the best sense for that. But it is something that we've certainly had discussions about inside the program, uh, knowing how high the community interest is and how much it's used. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Um, okay, looks like we have one more question from Richard. Are there known limitations of the plugins when working with a Lyricist hosted solution? Um, this is Tommy from Caltech. Um, Lyricist has been very responsive to us. They are our, our host, um, and they've enabled the plugins that we've asked for, which is only a couple. We've tried their own um, Islandora, A Space plugin, and the Harvard. Excel importer. There might be one or two other ones that we've asked for. Maybe um, I think we've asked for something to modify CSS or something like that. I don't know exactly, um, but they seem to be great, and I think they have a good handle on what is a safe plugin and what is not. Great, um, Blake. Blake said, "Yeah, it sounds like no." Um, but made sure to comment they were carefully review things first which is a great idea in terms of plugins and anything you're going to install um, bill asks how do you capture the physical material into the digital world and then link it into the various databases do you have to enter the file names manually or can you direct or can you capture directly into the um, dma i'm not sure what that is um, and bill feel free to chime in um, to clarify um, would anyone like to answer this one? 
So one of the things we do at Georgetown after we digitize a large set of items, we, we run what we call kind of an inventory task that just gives us a list of files that were generated during a digitization session. And then that helps us, that the file created by that process helps us link up with a metadata spreadsheet. Uh, so it's just kind of like another little, little step we have involving lots of CSV files and uh, spreadsheets. This is Tommy at Caltech. Um, our process involves something similar. When we do our digitization, whether it's in-house, when it's in-house, we have our digitizers follow a file name schema so they know their source material and they know our local identifiers and the file naming scheme is based on that, which the, can then be linked to the metadata via what I mentioned in our presentation, the collection ID, the series box and folder numbers, those are what make up a file name. And so can, so a file can always be identified with the metadata record it should go with. When we have digitization done by an outside uh, third party, we need to do some manual work to see what their process file names come out as and then map it to our own. So there's a little additional work built into that, but we can usually script it and rename a bunch of files in batch to make them work for us. Either that or all we actually have given to vendors exactly the file naming, the, the uh, naming schema that they should have follow. So then I went straight and used that. So um, then there wasn't even a further step. Uh, but that was uh, the file naming, uh, they would uh, link uh, the metadata, the descriptive metadata at folder level um, using the finding aid and the actual files is the way to do it, or at least the way we have done it. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so I think that was the last question that was entered into the chat. Um, our session ends at four, but I know there's a break after this and we've all um, agreed to stay on. So if there are additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Suzanne, just to chime in, um, I think there's just one more comment from um, Seth at the uh, University of Nevada, I think, uh, uh, which uh, where he talked about their work on linking archive space with Islandora 8. So I suppose that might be of interest to the folks at Caltech and anyone else who's using Islandora. So just wanted to put that out there. Great, thank you. So as Suzanne said, uh, we've reached the end of our time pretty much. Um, I think this was a great way to get the, the forum off and started. I'm so glad that so many of you were here. Uh, if you're joining us for the next block, as Suzanne said, we have a one hour break now. Uh, and then the next break, the next block will start in an hour. We hope to see many of you there. Uh, and please do fill out the survey if this is the end of your forum day. Uh, but otherwise, we'll see you back in an hour at the link that I posted in the chat there. Thanks. <laughs>